the continental shelf. It's easy to imagine that the ocean is full of fish, but we only think that because fish live near us, close to the land. Most fish live on the continental shelves, the part of the land that extends from the shore under the ocean, in some places only 29 miles and in others for hundreds of miles. In that shallower water, sunlight helps tiny sea organisms grow and become food for fish like cod. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean from America to Europe, a boat sails past many fish when it first leaves America. Then, once it goes beyond the North Atlantic continental shelf, it may go for days without being near a fish. As it gets close to Europe, approaching the European shelf, fish appear again. But in the northern part of the globe where cod live, the continents are close to each other. Britain is close to Iceland, which is close to Greenland, which is close to the Labrador and Newfoundland. The shelves of these land masses are even closer, and the water is cold. Since cod lives on shelves and lakes cold water, this is one place where the ocean can be crossed without ever being far from cod. Okay, so we have this little kind of diagram here that's showing us this is land. This is a continental shelf where all the cod live, and then this is a deep sea. So if you go to the coast, you'll be like, oh my goodness, there's fish everywhere because we stay up here on this continental shelf. We don't really go out here in the deep sea because that's scary. And then this is showing where there's always a bunch of um, cod because you have Britain and then you have Iceland and then you have Greenland and then we have Labrador and then you know Newfoundland and North America so there's always plenty of cod if you're sailing up here you're never really far away from the cod okay so we live we live around here okay well back there I think this is Africa Europe and then Canada's up here and then this is the Atlantic Ocean Vikings. Between the years 800 and 1100, the Vikings left their homes in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark to travel farther than Europeans have ever gone before, throughout Europe and all the way across the cold North Atlantic. They were able to travel such long distances because they had solved two of the greatest problems of ocean travel. First, the hull or bottom of a Viking ship could endure months of pounding ocean waves because the Vikings overlapped the planks instead of just placing them next to each other. And secondly, they had found food perfect for travel, dried cod. The Vikings learned to hang the cod in the cold, dry Arctic air until it was hard as wood. This tough, dry food had no fat, was full of protein, and would not spoil. Again, people were eating crazy stuff back then. I would not want to eat a piece of fish that is as hard as wood. The Vikings were traders, constantly in search of goods. Their limited northern products made from fur, reindeer antlers, and walrus tusks were not enough for prosperous trade, so they also sold into slavery people that they captured by attacking villages in Britain and France. This made the Vikings a feared warlike tribe. No Viking was more feared than Eric the Red. His father had been expelled from his native Norway for killing people, and then Eric was expelled from Iceland for doing the same thing. He left Iceland in about 982 with a son like Ericsson and a band of small followers. On a small open deck ship, they sailed west over the dark sea. The waves sometimes rolled three times the height of the Vikings' mass and threatened to crush them. But with their sail and oars, they skillfully rowed on just the right side of each wave until they arrived on, in a land of glaciers, rocks, and icebergs that glowed robin's egg blue. Okay, let's stop and think first for a second. What facts jump out to you that explain why cod was a useful resource in the early seafaring times? Do you think that you would enjoy eating dried codfish or stockfish? I know I wouldn't. Okay, here's here's stockfish. So we know about dried codfish. That's as hard as a piece of wood and just 100% protein. Here is stockfish. When it, cod, is taken to the far seas and desired to keep for 10 to 12 years, 
It is gutted and its head removed and is dried in the air and sun and in no wise by a fire or smoked. And when this is done, it's called stockfish. And when it hath been kept a long time and it is desired to eat it, it must be beaten with a wooden hammer for a full hour. Then set to soak in warm water for a full 12 hours or more. Then cook and skim it with very well like beef. Eric found a new land, which he named Greenland, to attract settlers. <clears throat> but there was no green, only white and blue ice and black and gray rock. The Vikings built a small colony, but after a few years hoping to find a better place, they caught more cod and hung it from poles to dry until they had enough food to sail farther west. Then, just as they were about to leave, Eric hurt his foot horse on a horse riding accident. He had to stay in Greenland, so his son, Life Erikson, led the next journey. Life sailed to a new place he called Stoneland, which was probably the rocky Labrador coast of Canada, then to Woodland, then to Vineland. They're very creative with their names. The identity of these three places is not certain. They may have been Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, or Maine. The Vikings found little food in these places, and angry tribesmen often attacked them. But they could keep traveling because they had their hard, dried fish to break off and eat like stale bread during the long winter months. Many historians did not believe that the Vikings had been to North America until 1960, when remains of eight Viking-built turf houses dated dating back from the 1000s were found in Newfoundland, proving that they had been to America long before Christopher Columbus. So we always think, oh, Christopher Columbus was the first one to find North America, but not really. Not really. The Vikings were. Life Erickson and his troop. The big secret. The Basques were probably the next Europeans to visit America. In the 14th and 15th century, most European fishing communities had heard rumors that the Basques were fishing in a land across the sea. The Basques live in a small area of velvety green mountains with rocky crests that is partly in southwestern France and partly in Spain. But they are neither Spanish nor French. They have their own customs, traditions, and language. The Basques were the first people to hunt whales for profit. At first, they caught them near beaches. But in the 9th century, the Vikings came to the land of the Basques. The Basques were able to discover how to build ships that could travel long distances the way the Vikings had. With these new strong ships, the Basques chased whales into northern waters, covering the sound of their oars with cloth so that they could row up to the sleeping, giant, sleeping black giants and plunge their long harpoons into the whale's side. Again, this goes back to that question that I was asking. How does this tiny little boat carry a big old whale? Especially if this weighs like, well, this probably doesn't weigh 70 tons, but like it weighs a lot. And that thing barely looks like it's above the water. How in the world? I don't know. The Basques traveled far north for whales, and by about the 1400s, they had found crowded schools of cod on the coast of the North Atlantic where the, Atlantic, where the Vikings had fished. By 1400, many Vikings had become Christian and had settled in very parts, various parts of northern Europe. The colonists on Greenland had died off, and the Basques had the waters of, the north, of north America to themselves. They began to sell cod in Europe, the first to earn money for from North American fish. Because the Basques were growing very rich selling cod, they did not want to tell anyone where they had found this huge school of fish. They did not claim the land. They built no settlements, though they did have camps in the summer where whale fat was cooked into oil and where cod fish were spread open, salted, and dried. Then in the fall, they loaded up their ships with barrels of whale oil and dried fish and they took off back to Europe to sail. Okay, so they didn't want anyone knowing where all these fish were, so they like didn't set up any settlements. They just kind of tried to be super secret about where they were getting their fish. Refrigeration 
and freezing had not yet been invented, and fresh fish spoiled quickly. So only people who lived on the coast could eat the fish <coughs> fresh. But the salted cod of the Basques could be stacked in carts and carried inland without spoiling. For the first time, many Europeans could eat fish. Here's a little thing about salting. The Basques did not just dry out the cod as the Vikings had. They salted it too. Unlike the Vikings, the Basques had plentiful salt supply from their trade in the Mediterranean. Dried and salted cod per preserved even better and could be soaked in water and returned back into soft, flaky fish. Explorers While the Basques were fishing secretly, other explorers were exploring in the world, using their often using sturdy Basque ships, hiring Basque navigators, and eating Basque salted cod. Christopher Columbus did all three in 1492 while he was sailing west looking for a route to Asia and landed in, instead in the Caribbean islands. Columbus was an Italian whose voyage was financed by the Spanish king and queen. <coughs> John Cabot, an Italian too, was also looking for a route to Asia. In 1497, Cabot landed in Newfoundland, which he claimed for Britain. Here he had stumbled across the Basque secret. His crew reported that the water was so thick with codfish that they only had to dip baskets in the water to scoop them out. Soon everyone was coming to North America for the codfish. The Portuguese, the British, and the French, they all fished the large codfish schools off of Canada. They reported seeing Basques. Some even said that they heard local tribesmen speaking the strange Basque language. In the 17th century, the rich codfish land was divided between the two most powerful nations, Britain and France. The Basque protested, saying that as the discoverers, they too were entitled to the part of, part of North America. All they wanted was the right to fish there. But they had never planted a flag, never made a claim, never told anyone, and now they had lost their fishing grounds. Okay, let's stop and think. Um... Is there any additional information on this page besides this main text? We have this picture that's kind of like showing us what's going on, but we also have this timeline. And there's been a timeline, there's a timeline right here showing about the Vikings, but we, now we have this timeline with the Europeans. So it says 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed to the Caribbean. 1497, John Cabot sails to Newfoundland and reports on the cod. 1524, Giovanni de Verrazenzo finds and explores what is now New York Harbor and the New England coast. 1535, Jacques Cartier explores and claims the mouth of the St. Lawrence River for France. He spots thousands of Basque fishermen in the area. In 1576, Sir Martin Friobisher leaves England on the first of three voyages and finds the Northwest Passage. Okay, so we have this timeline and it kind of helps us understand the story of how the Europeans found the cod. Cod becomes America. And oh, here's more of it. More of the timeline. In the early 1600s, a small religious group that had fled from England to Holland was looking for a permanent home. Hmm. Do we know what this this religious group might be? A place. Okay. A place that they could practice their religion and prosper. They considered an area on the northwest coast of South America called El Dorado, the legendary last city of gold. They also considered North America. In one day, these pilgrims gathered around a map of the coast of, little known, of the little-known North American continent. The map had been drawn by John Smith, a famous British adventurer, and it showed a small hook of land with a funny name, Cape Cod. Okay, let's think of our New England states. What New England state has kind of like a small hook of land? Like it's land and then it hooks out. What New England state might that be? In 1602, Barth Bartholomew Gosnold, a British explorer, had named the peninsula Cape Cod when he came sailing to the New England coast. He reported that his ship had been consistently pestered by cod. 
Interesting. 